When people talk about World War II survival, they focus on ration books, canned meat, and powdered eggs. What rarely gets discussed is the silent crisis that haunted civilians and soldiers alike once winter arrived. Fresh food simply vanished. Refrigeration was unreliable or non-existent. Fuel was rationed. Electricity was often cut. Yet people still needed vitamins, fiber, and real calories to stay healthy through months of cold. In Britain, occupied Europe, and even parts of North America, winter malnutrition was a real threat. Not starvation, but slow decline. Weakness, illness, and exhaustion caused by diets stripped of fresh vegetables. The solution that kept millions alive wasn't mechanical, electrical, or modern. It was architectural. A simple, deliberate design that controlled temperature, humidity, and airflow using nothing but earth, straw, and physics. This wasn't improvisation. It was doctrine. How wartime planners rediscovered an old solution and standardized it. The design wasn't invented during World War II. It was revived, refined, and deployed at scale. Governments issued pamphlets, diagrams, and instructions teaching civilians how to store vegetables through winter without iceboxes or power. In Britain, the Ministry of Agriculture actively promoted it as part of the Dig for Victory campaign. The structure was known by different names, depending on region. In Britain and Northern Europe, it was often called a vegetable clamp. In North America, it resembled an earth cellar or field cache. The principle was identical everywhere, though. Use the stable temperature of the ground to prevent freezing while keeping produce cool enough to slow spoilage. What made this a true World War II design was standardization. Dimensions, layering methods, drainage and ventilation were carefully specified so ordinary families could build one correctly the first time. How the design worked when everything else failed. At its core, the system relied on thermal mass and insulation. The ground, several feet below the surface, maintains a relatively constant temperature year-round. Even in deep winter, that temperature stays just above freezing in most temperate regions. Vegetables were stacked in layers, never dumped in piles. Root crops like potatoes, carrots, turnips, beets and parsnips were separated by straw, sand or dry soil. This spacing mattered. It allowed air circulation while preventing moisture buildup that leads to rot. The entire stack was then covered with more insulating material and finally sealed with soil. A small ventilation channel was often included, sometimes nothing more than a hollow reed or pipe, to allow excess moisture and heat to escape without letting frost in. No electricity, no moving parts, nothing to break. Now, most folks just assume a cellar alone is enough to handle winter storage. But, you know, during the war, World War II, Many cellars actually failed. Poor insulation, fluctuating temperatures, and all that dampness led to a lot of spoilage. The clamp system, on the other hand, it worked because it kept the produce isolated from those sudden swings in temperature. That's really why it preserved vegetables better than any old cellar or shed. Snowstorms, power outages, fuel shortages, none of that really mattered. The ground itself buffered everything. Even when the air outside dropped well below freezing, the vegetables inside the clamp stayed cool, but never froze. And, you know, that mattered a great deal. If potatoes freeze, they turn sweet and then start to rot. Carrots, if they freeze, just go mushy. Once they're damaged like that, they spoil awfully fast. The clamp prevented any freezing at all, 
and it slowed down the vegetables' respiration, which meant they could be stored for months longer. Civilians were taught quite carefully how to build and manage these clamps the right way. Wartime manuals, they emphasised preparation just as much as the actual construction. Vegetables were only harvested after they'd cured properly. Potatoes had to be dried before going into storage. Any damaged produce was left out entirely because, well, one bad route could ruin a whole section. It was all about doing things properly from start to finish. Access was controlled carefully, you know. You never opened the entire structure. You just exposed only what you needed and then resealed it right away. This, well, it minimised temperature disruption and kept moisture from getting in. Families learned to treat stored vegetables like a reserve, not just a pantry. Discipline really mattered. Now, here's the thing. This design kept nutrients in diets through those brutal winters. Fresh vegetables weren't some kind of luxury. They were medicine, plain and simple. Vitamin C deficiency, that was still a real worry during the war. But root vegetables stored this way. They held on to their nutrients far better than any canned alternatives. For civilians under rationing, this meant fewer illnesses and more resilience. And for soldiers stationed near farms or rural supply depots, it meant real food long after supply chains were strained. This quiet design reduced pressure on transportation networks and centralised storage. It uh, decentralised survival. How modern survivalists can apply the same principles today? The brilliance of this system is how little it depends on context. You don't need wartime conditions to benefit from it. Anyone with land, even a small yard, can apply the same logic. A shallow trench, good drainage, dry insulating material and careful produce selection accomplish most of the work. The physics hasn't changed. The earth still regulates temperature. Vegetables still respire the same way they did in 1942. Modern materials can improve reliability, but they aren't required. Why this World War II design has been quietly forgotten. Refrigeration made this knowledge seem obsolete. Centralised food systems made local storage unnecessary. Skills passed down for centuries faded within a generation. But, you know, history shows how fragile those systems are under stress. Wartime planners understood that real resilience came from simplicity, not from complexity. They didn't bet survival on uninterrupted power. What this design ultimately teaches us about wartime ingenuity is something pretty important. This wasn't just a clever trick. It was a philosophy. Use what cannot fail. Design for the worst conditions. Assume scarcity. Build systems that forgive mistakes. The vegetable clamp wasn't dramatic. It didn't look impressive, not at all. But it worked through blackouts, bombings, fuel shortages, and winters that broke morale. That's exactly why it deserves to be remembered. If this deep dive into a forgotten World War II survival design added something real to your understanding of wartime logistics and human resilience, then, well, subscribe to The Wartime Frontlines, share this with a fellow history enthusiast, and keep these lessons alive. Because, you see, history's quiet solutions often matter most when everything else collapses.